You're watching Medfield TV Community Shows. Welcome to the joint meeting of the Board of Selectmen, Medfield State House, the Master Planning Committee, Warrant Committee, and Planning Board. I've not forgotten anyone for June 12, 2018. Um, as always, this meeting is being video recorded, although it is not being live broadcast. So you might have an opportunity to manage to take some point of the tonight. And whatever you get to there on YouTube, just keep on the way. Um, we'll start as we do all of our board of second meetings with a moment of silence and appreciation for our troops serving the release around the world. Well, thank you uh, and welcome. And I think uh, we might as well get right into this. The way I thought we might proceed tonight, if everyone is okay with it, um, is we could start with the presentation from the Master Planning Committee. Um, I would then like to have a period of time for clarifying questions from members of the assembled boards. And so before we get into sort of expressions of opinion or whatnot, if people have questions of fact or questions of informational questions for the Master Planning Committee, we will do that for a period of time. Uh, if Depending on what time it is, we might have a similar set of questions for members of the public and then move into a general discussion. If anyone have an objection to proceeding in that manner. Okay, hearing none, I will turn it over to the Master Planning Committee. Uh, thanks, Mr. Marquise. Um, by way of introduction, um, hopefully you've all gotten the materials. I think Sarah sent them around for everyone to take a look at. So my proposal is that I go through the presentation fairly quickly because as any of you looked at it, you'll know it's pretty long. So um, there are some wagers about how long it's going to take me to get through this. Um, but I'll try and um, move quickly through it so that we can have plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. It had been our uh, hope that before this meeting, we would have been able to circulate a draft of our master plan um, that turned out not to be possible. We have a draft of the whole plan. It came in installments, and we have given pretty extensive comments, which um, our consultants are working on. So we have um, Dan Mecca and Kevin McKay here with us, and they've been working on trying to incorporate the edits they received from the committee. Um, but it wasn't in a shape that the committee felt comfortable distributing yet. So this, uh, we did circulate the executive summary, we circulated the table of contents so you could get a feel for what will be in the plan, and then we put together this presentation to try to capture some of the, um, some of the key elements of the plan. But as uh, you know, if you've looked at it, it's not as comprehensive as the, as the plan itself will be. So. Um, so we do ask that you bear with us in that regard. There's a lot more detail to come in the future. Um, so the, um, the agenda for our presentation is sort of split up this way. We have some key takeaways at the beginning. Um, we have a sort of synopsis of our charge, an overview of some of the key elements of the plan, um, a look at some financials, but it's fairly limited. Um, a few slides talking about implementation, phasing, disposition, management, some recommendations, and then some ideas for next steps. So here are some of the key takeaways. Um, we have a high, pretty high level of confidence that the Netfield community will like this plan. We had a lot of um, sessions with the public, as many of you participated in. Um, so we took a lot of input, and we tried to distill <coughs> that and address as many of the comments and concerns as possible um, in coming up with our plan. Um, so we, we feel we feel good about the plan, and, and we think the public will uh, will rally around it. <coughs> it take, takeaway number three. Uh, this one. Takeaway number two. Uh, plan balances community goals with many constraints. Um, I, I think you've heard of so many of the constraints in the past. We have an empty <coughs> mass historic. Uh, we have a site that's covered with a large number of existing buildings, most of which would need significant work to be put to alternative uses. Um, we have, we're surrounded by some state conservation land on either side of the property. There's not a lot of infrastructure at the site because most of the infrastructure that was there from when the site was operational is, is beyond repair, so it will need to be replaced. So there are a lot of constraints on the redevelopment um, effort that have influenced the plan. Um, I think when we first purchased this property, there was a pretty significant um, 
consensus that this was a, a really important opportunity for the town and that this was really going to be one of the most significant <coughs> undertakings of the town in our in our history. So uh, we've been conscious of that um, and also conscious of the idea of creating a sense of place um, that requires a certain amount of long-term thinking and long-term investment in the property. Um, it, it's from everything we've heard, people just don't want to turn it over to a developer and just say, go at it, you know, put 600 houses up there or, or you know, a few apartment buildings or whatever. They really wanted to have some kind of town uh, investment there that would create a sense of place that the whole community could enjoy. So that's a, a, another factor that, that we consider important. Um, another thing we want to emphasize, there's a lot of flexibility in the plan. So I think that the spirit of the plan is that it's a, it's a document that creates a vision, but it's not intended to be prescriptive. So it's not our idea that this is what will happen. We've tried to build in flexibility. Um, in designing the zoning, we've tried to build in a certain amount of flexibility. But on some things, and not on everything. Um, so we'll get to that discussion a little bit more later on. Um, and the idea that this development is likely to occur in phases. Um, and that's a pretty important um, feature of this, both in, in the sense that the town may want to control the phasing or a developer may want to control the phasing and making decisions about how that phasing will happen is pretty important um, and whoever is in charge of implementing this plan uh, or whatever plan is adopted will have to think a lot about how that uh, phasing might unfold. Um, and our other takeaway, we think the financials indicate a workable starting point. But we've gotten bogged down a lot in the financials and uh, and that's been good and bad. I mean, it's, it's good, we think, to kick the tires seriously about it, but at, at the point where we're at in planning, this is really a conceptual plan. So it's hard to get to too high a degree of, of specificity on the financials. Um, we have tested them enough to feel pretty confident about the, the town side of the financials, um, and to some extent, the developer side. The developer side is a little more... Um, I don't know what, when I say questionable, but at least it's a little more open to um, concerns about whether there's enough profit in it for a developer. But we didn't view it as our mission to maximize profit for a developer, but rather to come up with a plan that we thought the town would support um, in the hopes that, not, not disregarding the developer's return, but at least feeling like the developer's going to know the answer to that better than we could ever come up with. So, so here's some of the key drivers. Um, our charter from the selectmen. Um, we, we got an original charter from you when we were formed, and then we got a subsequent memo from you which kind of spelled out some of the questions and concerns you had. Um, and and uh, we've, we've taken both of those um, sets of guidance into account. We also did a lot of um, probing with the community about what their goals were and objectives. Um, so we also um, have factored that into our considerations. So part of our charter was presented to the Board of Selectmen a comprehensive and coordinated vision for sustainable, sustainable redevelopment and reuse of the former Metro State Hospital. And some of the concerns were costs and revenues from the perspective of the town, the taxpayer, and the developer. Flexibility in zoning, phasing, when to develop what, uh, and justification for our choice to make comparable plans, um, trying to justify if we departed from highest and best use, why we did that, um, and looking at relevant uh, demographic and market trends. <coughs> Um, some of the community's concerns were control our own destiny, um, a high priority in a lot of the surveys was open space and recreation um, and maintaining public access. There was a pretty strong reaction by a lot of members of the public against creating kind of a gated community there which would be um, exclusive of, of the members of the public. Um, people prefer this to be an inclusive type of development. Uh, mix of housing, there were a lot of different um, desires in the housing world from 40B to um, try to reach our 10% uh, to creating senior housing to address that demand um, and also trying to minimize the impact on our schools. And then a the sense of place. So creating a mixed use, um, not just uh, exclusively housing, to be uh, respectful of the history, um, to try to save the <coughs> people as a priority. Uh, to create a destination, um, including cultural attractions, restaurants, community gardens, uh, and keep the charm, beauty, vistas, character of the site. Uh, so here's some, just a synopsis of some of the engagement numbers. Um, we had four formal outreach meetings. We did 30 catalyst meetings um, with businesses and other organizations. We did four appearances at Medfield Day, three separate public surveys, um, 
we got 2,840 survey responses. So we got a pretty high degree of participation by the public. We did videos. Um, we did news blasts in our, um, in our social media campaign. We have 700 followers on Facebook, 300 on Twitter, 115 on Instagram. Um, and we've had 86, I guess, and counting meetings, um, <laughs> totaling over 2,600 hours. So it's been a significant amount of time by the committee members here and our resource members as well, as well as members of the public who came fairly reliably to our meetings. So a synopsis of some of the uses. Um, Here's master plan, which is pretty hard to read, but there's a, there's a hard copy there, and what do we have here? Um, another copy here. Um, probably easiest to go by the colors rather than the building numbers, but um, and, and a lot of these buildings are zoned for more open-ended use, but these are our, our sort of preferred uses. Um, so we have a single family area down on um, what we call the Arboretum area, which is down here in the southeast quadrant. Um, we have a residential, a large component of residential around the uh, quad, as well as a couple of new buildings on the upper left there. Uh, we have a good sprinkle of commercial uses, um, especially on what we call the western slope um, towards the state land, towards the river. Uh, we have an arts and culture component, um, especially at the Lee Chapel and the infirmary here right in the middle of the core of campus. Um, we have uh, some mixed use, which is um, different possible commercial type uses, not, not, uh, as well as mixed with residential. So for instance, ground floor commercial, but maybe upper floor residential. Um, and we have arts, um, live workspace, uh, which is here in, the, in these two buildings for um, a, a potential type of housing that would foster participation by the arts community. And then we have recreation space as well. Um, South of the south of Hospital Hill, you really can't see it on this diagram, but we have you can see it on the bigger ones. We have space laid out for a potential park and rec building. Um, we know that they're still undergoing their own study to decide where their best siting for that facility is, but um, we've designated that as as public work, public recreation or municipal recreation. I guess so. If it wasn't a park and rec facility, it could be uh, fields or some other uh, recreational use. Here's a breakdown of square footage on the uses. Um, the predominance is residential, 62%, so 26% commercial, 8.2% um, civic, which is really the park and rec or middle school recreation, and then 35 is arts. <coughs> so again, back to the concept of creating a sense of place. So for us looking at the whole redevelopment plan, the idea was to, to create um, enough different things going on at the, at the site but with some important themes, um, the Lee Chapel as a cultural hub, a possible CCRC or independent living, <coughs> restaurant, gallery, other small businesses, um, some office space, potential inn that's a hard one to accomplish, so that's probably a future, uh, a future project. Uh, community gardens and agriculture, trying to be respectful of the agricultural history of the property, and then as we said, parks and rec um, uses. Yeah, here's a breakdown of the housing, 73% uh, market, 26% affordable. Um, so it is still predominantly market, but with a, with a sizable mix of affordable units. Um, 181 historic rehab apartments um, under the historic credit. Uh, properties have to stay rental for at least five years and then could convert to condominium if desired. Um, we have 22 to 40 market rate condos. We have senior appropriate housing, which is mostly located down at the uh, Arboretum areas. I mentioned. We have uh, 18 millennial appropriate apartments in the East Hall, uh, 16 live work studios for creative professionals, uh, and 52 to 75 CCRC or independent living units. Uh, so we have a pretty big emphasis on uh, public and open space paths to, to continue the access that the public now enjoys to the site. It's a terrific site to walk on. It's, it's high, creates a lot of visibility uh, and vistas. Um, so this is, uh, it shows the sort of network of a lot of the existing sidewalks, proposed new sidewalks, and links to some of the surrounding trail networks um, as well. We have an obligation uh, under, the, um, under our land disposition agreement with the state to create connection between the state land on um, the east and west sides of the core campus, so part of the trail network achieves that uh, requirement as well. 
Uh, here's a summary of some of what we think are priorities for open space, um, including the green, um, which is the, the open area down front, and the common town square, uh, the overlook over the Charles, the north field we call it, which is the, which is the portion of undeveloped land closest to Dover, uh, the water tower site, the arboretum, um, which is we propose for development, but also want to preserve a lot of the natural vegetation that's currently there. And then a couple of the, uh, and then the south field and sliding hill. <coughs> so here's a diagram showing the areas I've just been talking about. So you can, um, you can see what we're describing there. And also on this slide are the um, scenic views from from the uh, hospital property. So concerns about uses um, that have been raised. Um, we looked at a lot of other developments. Hard to find one that's precisely analogous to the, to the local state hospital, but we did look at things like the Foxborough State Hospital, which is depicted here, um, as well as Dander State Hospital, Northampton, and a number of other state hospitals, um, and other large-scale redevelopments of historic buildings. Um, as far as departure from greatest economic value, the market studies that we looked at pretty consistently said the highest and best use, if you will, from an economic perspective is housing. Um, we're, a, we're a predominantly housing community. We don't have great infrastructure for, for commercial or businesses. Um, but, you know, we, we have a lot of concerns. I know that the select one have expressed concerns about our, our tax base and wanting to make it more diverse and wanting to include commercial uses. Um, so we have deliberately included those types of uses in our plan, even though uh, if you really drove strictly to the highest and best use, you might say it should all be housing. Uh, so we really looked at non-economic values. Um, we looked at the density and tried to uh, be responsive to community concerns about not creating too large, too dense of a project there. Um, and uh, as I said, we're trying to generate some commercial and other types of uh, revenue. Um, Looking at some of the relevant trends, we talked to, we, had, we held a developer roundtable fairly early in the process and got a lot of useful feedback. Um, and one key element of that was we, we heard a lot of interest by developers. Um, we invited different types of developers, um, and most were residential, residentially focused, but some had done mixed use projects as well. Um, so there was a pretty strong desire to do residential, and some wanted to do, you know, Pine Hills type community or some other gated community. There was a lot of interest in that because it's a big site. It would be um, great for them to do that. But um, when we tested that with the public, there was a lot of um, uh, repudiation, I guess, of that idea uh, in the public. Um, we had several market studies done. DCAM had done one with Jones Lang LaSalle. Uh, our first consultant, BHB, did one with RKG. And uh, our current consultant did one. And, and Gene Minio's group also commissioned one with respect to mostly focused on the arts and culture aspect. Uh, we also did a lot of analysis of school population impacts, trying to measure how many students there would be and what the cost of the incremental cost of the student is of um, the town finances. Uh, as I said earlier, we looked at catalyst activities. We met with a lot of different groups. We took some field trips. We went to Danvers to look at their state hospital. We went to Foxborough. We went to Mole, which was a pretty key meeting for a lot, a lot of members of the committee because they really got to see how um, the historic rehab uh, credit can work to rehab buildings that are, that are in you know, rough shape. And if you looked at them, you'd say they're about to fall down. And yet, we're able to be rehabbed into pretty vibrant uh, communities using the historic tax credit. And we leaned on our consultants' expertise as well um, in looking at uh, potential uses. Zoning, um, we've divided up the property for zoning purposes into these different sub-districts. Um, so some of these are more flexible than others. The, the key um, are things like the sledding hill, the green, the north field. Uh, we've largely tried to keep as open space. One of the priorities a lot of people expressed was that they liked the amount of open space there, and they, and they would prefer to concentrate development in the areas of the site that are already developed, um, as opposed to just developing the entire site. So although we've developed more of the Arboretum, which was previously mostly open space, although there were some cottages there, um, otherwise we've largely stuck to the, um, the areas that have, have existing development. 
Um, and the other exception is the south field, which we've paid for recreational uses. Sledding Hill would stay open. Um, and the water tower would be used potentially for parking and for community gardens, but otherwise would, um, would not be the site of any significant development. So the core campus, West Slope, we didn't circulate our actual zoning table, but um, within those districts, uh, sub-districts, I should say, there's a pretty broad range of uses from, from housing to uh, commercial, office, uh, cultural activities. So there's a, there's a pretty large laundry list of permitted uses, or some of which require a um, special permit or planning board, site plan approval, um, if, if, they're, if they're more intense uses or less consistent with our vision uh, for the plan at this point. Uh, financials, uh, just some snapshots of, of things that we looked at. Um, and, and these are hard to interpret because they're just a, an image. Um, but here is a here's a shot of the net municipal re revenues. MSH North is the area north of um, Hospital Road, so it basically takes up the bulk of the plan. And this this assumes that we are, are leasing land as opposed to selling it. Uh, and it assumes that infrastructure is paid for by the town, either by a dip or a TIF, um, and we'll get into some of the differences of those in, the, in a few slides, um, and that the developer will contribute in some respect to the infrastructure. So this shows um, a million three seventy of <coughs> revenue per you know, net revenue to the town. And I think that's starting in year twenty thirty, if I remember right. That right now. Yeah, thank you, please. I think it starts a little earlier, but by 2030, it's a 1.3 million net revenue. That includes real estate taxes and other revenues. Okay. Um, here's another slide, similar, but um, again, shared infrastructure costs. Um, so excluding our breed of area generates net cash flow of million four. Now this is a, a plan really trying to show two different possible approaches to development at the at the arboretum which is pretty hard to see but one one approach would, would be a sale of the land and, and trying to protect it, as many of the specimen trees there as possible which is on the left hand side the right hand side more of the land it really doesn't show up well on the slide is 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 a protected conservation land because it's a leasehold uh, approach to the arboretum uh, we looked at possible phasing economics. The problem with looking at phasing is that there's a lot of different possible scenarios that you can come up with to try to test, um, and a lot of different assumptions that could go into each of the scenarios. So this is looking at the arboretum um, being leased to a developer. The developer would pay for water and sewer infrastructure. The town would pay for roads. And this shows the net, uh, net positive, uh, but really barely uh, positive uh, net cash flow for the town. So we have a few scenarios like this, uh, which we try to play out, depending on who is paying for infrastructure, whether the, the town would pay for some, whether we'd try to extend the infrastructure all the way up to the Lee Chapel as part of the first phase in order to enable its possible reuse uh, as a cultural facility. Um, Gene's finances you are assuming um, that the infrastructure is reasonably close by to the chapel so that's that's a something to keep in mind as, as far as how to organize a first phase uh, but this shows you know that negative uh, if the town is trying to support those on its own and, and on its own meaning with just the arboretum as the as the income generating so the question would be if you were trying to achieve that in the first phase would be whether there are other things you can include in the first phase to try to turn the, the uh, finances from the town's perspective positive. Uh, and here's another model with, the, with land sale as opposed to leasing, um, which is more positive. Um, so that's a helpful comparison. We've, we've generally thought that ground leasing is a good model for disposition to allow the town to maintain more control. Um, the problem in a, sit, in a for sale housing model is that people don't aren't familiar with ground leases and aren't terribly comfortable with owning a house on a ground lease. A lot of businesses, you know, that's well beyond their, their horizon for a profit return, but a, but a homeowner is looking at the home and thinking it's going to appreciate and become an asset they can pass to future generations. And if you're on a land lease, um, that pretty much undermines that expectation. So um, I think that's reflected in, in the slide. Um, the other thing we did was to look at alternatives, although we don't have a lot of costing information at this point. I mean, we do have costing information, we just haven't run 
the scenarios because there's a lot of different alternatives we could pursue, such as a complete demolition of the buildings, and we do have some numbers on what the demolition would cost, especially if it's done at prevailing wages um, by the town. Um, other alternatives are more of a status quo approach, which is just continue to operate it as it is now with some limited revenue opportunities, potentially, um, but with the town largely spending money to maintain the site and try to control um, the decay of the buildings. One thing we learned is that if you really look at demolition by neglect, which is the term people talk about, um, eventually if a building falls down, it's a lot more expensive to dispose of than if it's still standing because the remediation costs are higher. If you can go into a, a building that's standing and remediate any hazardous substances, that's a pretty limited undertaking, and then demolish the rest. Once it collapses, all the materials there are contaminated, and so it's much more expensive. You have to dispose of all the materials as potential hazardous substances. Um, infrastructure has been the, the uh, elephant in the room, I guess, on, on trying to design plans because as I mentioned earlier, the infrastructure there is not usable, so a lot of the infrastructure will have to be recreated, including a, a possible pump station for handling sewage from the site, so that's a pretty big expense, as well as all the network of roads and, uh, and, and uh, other utilities. So um, the unsolved challenge is that developer returns on, a, on, on their own will not likely be robust enough to pay for the cost of the infrastructure. So that may lead, if this is put out, say, to a bid for a master developer to take it over, the developers may look for higher density than the town wanted or look for town financial contributions um, in order to help with that infrastructure cost. Um, phasing may be a technique that allows some kind of segmentation of the infrastructure um, that might be attractive, at least in the near term, but it, it's pretty important to think about your overall strategy before going far down the road on a first phase that might then be inconsistent with the rest of your plan. Um, now covering administrative costs, even if the town um, isn't paying for infrastructure, we still probably have some significant costs coming if you really want to embark on a redevelopment. Um, there will be consultant fees potentially or staff costs depending on how the town wants to approach that to have someone to monitor the redevelopment um, and really watch out for the town's interests. Um, some of these may be allowable costs with our development, I mean, our land disposition agreement with BCAM. As I think probably most of you know, we have a, share, a profit sharing arrangement with them, so to the extent we were to make profit on selling any particular aspect of the, of the property, we'd have to split that with BCAM. Um, they'll look at 52, 48, or 52 and a half, 47 and a half at this point. Um, the, the unfortunate aspects of the cost sharing arrangement are that if, if, if that costs that we incur are then prorated across the entire site. So say you had a 100 acre site and you spent $200,000, that's 2,000 an acre. If you sold 10 acres, you could then recover 20,000 of that ahead of splitting anything with BCAMs. It only allows a, a proportionate amount of our expenses to be recaptured. Um, and then other possible things to think about might be uh, early action of getting some kind of legislative um, legislative enactment to allow for something like an enterprise fund up there. If, if the desire was to do it in some kind of phased approach with the town deciding on the phases and selling them, if you sold a profitable phase early on to, to bank those revenues to try and help assist on paying infrastructure down the road. Um, other financing mechanisms um, that we looked at as possibilities. Um, historic tax credits, as I mentioned, are a pretty powerful tool to give developers an incentive to rebuild and reuse existing buildings. I know that Gene's uh, model for the arts and culture facility assumes taking advantage of the historic tax credits, but developers uh, may want to do that as well. It's not required, but it's a it's a powerful tool for helping uh, in the rehabilitation. Under our agreement with the Mass Historic, we're required to at least create a level playing field for rehabilitation of the buildings. Um, so if we go out in RFP, um, we can't just say, we're selling these, but you must tear them all down. We would presumably go out and say a couple of different possible things. One would be, you have to save the buildings, which we don't really propose to do that. Another would be, we encourage the preservation of the buildings and we'll factor that into our decision on who the bidder is who selected. Um, so that you might, if, if two bidders came in and one was willing to pay you $10 million and tear the buildings down and another was going to pay you eight, but save the buildings, you might choose the $8 million bid because you really prioritize potentially saving the buildings. 
um, but at least we have to create a level playing field. We don't have to take less for it, but at least we have to uh, create that level playing field. So we've estimated that based on you know preliminary numbers about how much it would cost to rehab the buildings that it could be worth at least $34 million uh, to store credits to the developer. That's not, that's not a, a technique that the town could use. It's a technique for the developer. Um, so you heard me earlier talk about TIF and DIF. Um, the, the TIF proposal would be that the town would share future tax revenues with the developer. Um, this is a technique that allows the developer to uh, recover some of the costs of redeveloping an expensive site. So um, the town would, would come up with a projection about what the revenues, increased revenues from the development are going to be and agree to share some or, or potentially all of it with the developer, but most towns will only share some of it because you have to pay for your own uh, expenses as well. So that uh, future stream will allow the developer potentially to, to use that as a source of collateral for a loan to help pay for infrastructure costs. Um, there are different uh, possible approaches from a state perspective. You can't just do this as a matter of state law without some specific authorization. Um, so we could get the property designated as an economic opportunity zone by the Commonwealth, or we could act actually also get special legislation allowing us to do a tax increment uh, financing approach. And the advantage is that, that we're not going out with a bond, and so we're not paying for the infrastructure and hoping that the site gets developed. We'd be offering up that as an incentive. The developer would only recover on the pledge of tax revenues if they did the redevelopment, because only then would there be a tax increment to share with the developer. So it shifts the burden of the risk on um, development to the developer, not to the town. If bonds are a slightly different technique in which the town would actually um, issue a bond based on the future stream of revenues. So this, as you can immediately tell, would be a more risk to the town that for some reason the developer went bankrupt or the market turn in the development didn't occur and yet the bond had already been issued. So um, our feeling is that the TIF approach that I described first would be more acceptable to the town than going with a TIF bond, but, but both are open to exploration. Another possibility is mass works grants. There are Grants that if the, if the state feels it's a priority redevelopment, and since this is a partnership with the state, we at least have some um, expectation that they might view favorably a redevelopment of the site, um, and, and they can get pretty significant infrastructure grants. Of up to, um, I know I've seen them up to 10 to 15 million dollars. That still wouldn't cover all the expected costs of infrastructure, but would be a significant uh, dent in it. Um, they don't require repayment. The money can come to the town and then be subgranted to the developer who would do the work. So just because the town got the grant doesn't mean the town would actually be doing the work. Um, but it may require some upfront investment to do a level of uh, partial design drawings in order to apply for this financing. So there is an investment that would have to be made to even apply for the grants. Um, implementation. I've already alluded to this leasing versus selling. Um, we generally favor the ground leasing approach. It could be a ground lease for 99 years to a developer. Um, gives the town more control. You can always um, terminate the lease if the developer didn't uh, comply with the requirements that were built into the lease. So it does allow the town more, um, more oversight options. Um, and as I said earlier, it works best for residential rental or commercial less well for ownership. Uh, phasing. So as I said earlier, given the scope of this and, and absorption rates that, that our market studies showed, it's unlikely anybody would develop the whole site at once because it would be hard to um, absorb all the additional housing. Um, so it's likely to be phased in some fashion, so the question really is how that phasing happens and who's in control of the phasing. Um, I mean, there are two different approaches here. You could say that the town is really going to divide the site up and, and dispose of it itself. It's easier, I think, on a ground lease approach because in ground leasing, you don't actually have to do a subdivision. You can actually just um, parcel it off. Um, and um, you, you worry about it. access, of course, and roads have to be put in, but you don't have to go through a formal subdivision approval as you would if you were going to sell. The uh, front part, the arboretum might be logical for, for actually being subdivided and sold and also has frontage on hospital roads. So it would be an easier thing to subdivide with an approval not required plan, um, but the back parts of the site that would be more of a challenge, and rather than going through a subdivision process, we would suggest it's easier to be flexible in disposition by ground leasing. Um, but the site, but even so, the town could ground lease 
parts of the site if they chose to. The challenges there will be um, trying to control the infrastructure and make sure that the, that if a developer releases a site and then is putting in the infrastructure, that we require infrastructure that's that's um, large enough to service other portions of the development rather than just that developer's own project. So that becomes a challenge of coordination if you want to go that route. The other option is going for with a master developer, in which case you could also get into the phasing in your RFP and say, well, here we want proposals for how you're going to phase it. Or you could say, uh, you know, we recommend this be a first phase. Or you could even say a responsive uh, proposal has to have this as a first phase or this as a second phase, whatever. So you can get more and more uh, prescriptive in your RFP, but of course the more prescriptive you are, uh, the more limited your responses may be because some developers may find that um, to be too, um, to interfere with their development proposals. So it may be best to be, you know, suggest the phasing but allow developers to come back with their own proposals on how to phase and then factor that into your decision on, on who you select. Um, this position, again, the town could be deciding when to sell pieces or the town could put the whole redevelopment out for a bid to a master developer. Um, these sites are, I mean, these slides are pretty detailed, so I won't go through them, but they kind of lay out some of the thought process that we've been through as far as this decision of whether you dispose of it in sections, whether you put it out for a full RFP for the for all the redevelopment, or some combination. I mean, it could be possible to put out the entire core campus, but hold back the west slope um, in order to let things evolve. The west slope we've slated for a lot of commercial development, so it's possible that the town may decide to retain those um, that that portion of the site and see how things go, but dispose of the rest. Um, and that may particularly be the case because it may be a different type of developer that we're looking for to develop some of those commercial uses that might be the logical developer for the core campus. Um, so in either case of those approaches, the town would still need in-house or outside expertise um, to monitor. Probably more so if you're going to do it in, in parcels because then the town really has to be on top of how that phase is going to work and how the pieces are going to fit together. Um, we need to do have zoning, design guidelines, um, and be conscious of our agreements with the state. Um, look to our master plan for guidance, um, and then hopefully use land leasing to serve as a control mechanism. And, and it's important to recognize that success or failure in the early phase will influence the value of the rest of the site. So if you if you sell a arboretum, for instance, and it turns into a really um, nice community and good sales, and it's really popular that might be really uh, positive for the rest of the site and we view this as like the cultural center as the same kind of uh, factor that if you develop the cultural center earlier on that that will energize the site and, and be uh, it will enhance the value of the rest of the site. So some of the key questions um, that we have disposition that I've alluded to should the town get into disposing of it in parcels or putting the hands out now? It's an important decision that will have to be made in, in trying to implement the plan. Um, expertise and management, you know, do we hire someone, do we retain a consultant, do we retain outside legal counsel? I mean, there's, there's decisions about that which are important to understand and to um, decide how we're going to approach those and try to implement the plan. And then questions about how we approach the plan and implementation over the next month. So disposition strategy, we have not made a recommendation. We have different views on that. Uh, and I think there's different views in the community as well from what we've heard as to whether it makes more sense to do a, a disposition to a master developer or have the town be more uh, involved in trying to decide on phasing. Uh, staffing up, we do recommend that we hire a program manager, retain outside counsel to keep the plan goes forward. Um, we think it's too uh, significant a project to expect that our existing staff, basically amounts to Sarah, <laughs> will be able to manage this entire uh, effort uh, if, if the town does get serious about doing the redevelopment um, and outside council, just the, the demands of, of uh, negotiating um, the contracts you know, may be um, significant enough to get an additional legal help may be important. Uh, next steps. Our first next step is to finalize the plan. As I mentioned, we were hoping to be able to share a draft with you, but, um, but we're pushing hard to try to 
get a draft finalized um, in the near term. Um, our consultant, Kathy, has said she can incorporate all our edits by, by end of the month, and we're hoping to be able to turn it around shortly thereafter to, to have a final plan available. Um, and then we would share the plan with the, with the community more broadly. Um, we would decide whether the, the selectmen would basically decide whether to convene another committee or how to guide the implementation or how they want to approach implementation. Um, schedule a special town meeting for a vote on proposed zoning if, if uh, the selectmen are favorably inclined and want to do that. Um, decisions on whether to hire a project manager or a legal counsel and then preparation of RFPs depending on whether the town wants to move forward um, with this position. Um, again, I think the next group is going to have to look hard at this question of disposition strategy to decide what makes the most sense. Um, and we think it's important for the town to show support for the efforts of the Cultural Alliance to move forward on the cultural hub because regardless of what happens, um, they're pretty committed and, and uh, we think that would be a great asset for the town and also, um, as I mentioned, a pretty strong enhancement for the overall redevelopment prospects. And then support efforts by Park and Rec to determine whether the, if and when they'll build their facility south of Hospital Road. So they're, they're on their, have commissioned their study, so we'll have to wait to see what that, uh, what that reveals. But, uh, but the site is there, and it seems like a potentially good one for their purposes. So that's it. I think uh, okay. like I said it was going to be like a kind of FedEx commercial, so I think pretty much did that. <laughs> so hopefully you get enough out of this to uh, have some questions. But, uh, but that would go to your next step in the agenda. Yeah, I, I think it was your slide that says thank you, but I think to begin with, we should thank all of you. Twice as short hours translates into an hour away, so we're going to have to sacrifice. We can never depend on the bill on an hourly basis. So, if we can start with questions, I'll, I'll start with playing board. If anyone in the playing board have some factual or clarifying questions about the um, master plan or anything like that, please. <coughs> Right. No question. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Steve and committee. Uh, so, any developers going to come the equation and have a, uh, a full market study, location uses concept, competition with risk involved? Uh, some of the financials right now are general. <coughs> Maybe not as specific as I personally would like to see him not speaking for the rest of us here. Um, it's one concern. Another concern that I have, you can interrupt or inject any thoughts you have. Um, <coughs> just assume there's a question mark at the end of these things? Yeah, question mark. I've been waiting to eat with you, so. We'll try as well, because, I mean, Pat is here, and Pat's done probably the, the lion's share of the work on, on our side of the plan, which is in coordinating with um, Jack and Mark and Joanna about you know, the, the questions from the warrant committee. So, I mean, this this isn't the full blown financial analysis, obviously, and there's a lot more behind this that's still being finalized. But I, Pat, I don't know if you want to offer anything up. I mean, I mean one of the concerns that Pat and I have talked about is that we sort of gone down this road of trying to really drill down the financials, but it's pretty tough to exercise to do at this at this phase of the uh, of the evolution of the project. So that is one of the limitations that we're facing. The other being just our budget for consulting time. We, we have uh, hammered our consultant repeatedly, <laughs> Kathy will I'm sure agree, but about the financials and went back to them and trying to, you know, get them more exact and, and, and looking at different parameters and allowing us to you know, have as much flexibility in looking at the financials. But we're basically out of money now, so it, it, it's, it's hard for us to do too much more um, to get into the weeds on it. We do have the financial model as a deliverable at the end of the day to provide us with a tool to potentially continue to look at it and to own the financials going forward. But, it, but at some point, we sort of have to um, you know, draw the line because we've got to finish this plan and it's already <coughs> the financial the biggest reason for delays in our schedule. So I'll just preface it with that and then Pat, you know, offer any other thoughts. Well, I guess I would say that um, you may recall that we did um, 
like Monte Carlo analysis and stuff like that from the town's perspective, from the developer's perspective. And uh, we did that as, with the financials um, as they stood at the beginning of April. We've got a new, uh, they've been revised and we've got a hold of them recently. I'm, I've started down the path of doing the same thing, but um, and did that over the course of last evening and this, and this morning uh, since you know, the information is fresh. And I wouldn't say it's dialed in uh, all the way, so I would be uh, hesitant to try to, you know, go, you know, well into the weeds right in this session. Uh, but if we had, um, you know, if we schedule a subsequent session, um, you know, we can get that dialed in and, uh, you know, give you guys as much detail as you, you know, we'll, we'll try to make our best effort, right, to uh, answer any uh, any questions that you bring up tonight um, at that uh, at that uh, future <coughs> that future session. The other thing I'll just offer is, um, you know, we have we've um, had a discussion about, you know, the develop. You know, we we have to pick up the infrastructure, you know, to make it attractive to the developer, and that was, I would say you know, within the constraints of, um, let's say, conventional thinking about how things uh, could, be, could be financed. You know, what we do know from the, uh, the initial analysis, you know, the way we've carved it up now is things look about okay for a developer, but they can swing positive and they can swing negative, and we know that that um, <coughs> represents a risk. They do look positive from the town's perspective, uh, looking at you know the conventional set of you know cash flows you know, you know how much we're putting out for schools how much we're getting in tax revenue and so on and you know what's been called to our attention recently which I don't claim to fully understand the mechanisms is this TIF and DIF financing so knowing that the overall numbers look positive for this plan uh, I'm confident but not certain that we can use those mechanisms to move that positive value around to mitigate front end risk if we elect to. Can, can you share the, the mechanism for the, the start of the revenue in 2030 at uh, 9370? That's my bill full bill incorporated. Incorporated into what exactly? Well, the statement was made that the town would start seeing revenue in the year 2030. Well, th th that's, I think <coughs> the revenue is coming before that. That's the point at which it reaches the higher level of the 1.4 yeah. million. That, this that's isn't a, a trick question. I was just curious. And I was uh, connected to that is up front, you're making a cause or a case for um, park and rec and the cultural component um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the next steps. And I, I guess I'm just kind of a little bit at a loss for how these would generate revenue. Well, I, I, that's one thing I, I should have pointed out was in my mental list of doing it, but I didn't, which is that neither the park and rec nor the um, cultural facility are on the books, so to speak. So those are both considered off budget and they're responsible for raising their own capital um, expenses um, so that they aren't factored into that, so that, that that's that's not part of our projection. But, you know, we're not saying that we have money to pay for those. Teams doing fundraising and Pure Park and Rec will do the same um, for their own facilities. Um. Uh, what did you take away from the visits to uh, uh, Foxborough, Danville, Slovo? Was there any uh, anything that threw you off your stride, or anything that gave you new ideas? Of how did that all go? Each had different approaches. <coughs> For instance, Danvers did. Uh, Danvers had a long and sorry track record. They had a, uh, a developer that no. ended up going bankrupt, and so that stalled. They brought in another developer. Um, they had a different kind of facility. They had um, what they call a Kirkbride building, which is sort of this massive long building. 
Um, and the developer that ended up um, winning the second round of RFP ended up coming with a plan that they gutted that whole building but saved the facade and then basically built another building inside that facade and then added a whole bunch of new construction around the perimeter of that. So it was a pretty, it was a pretty dense development in the end. Um, it wasn't, I, I don't believe they qualified for a store of credits because uh, they gutted the inside of the building. So, um, so it was a pretty different model. Um, Foxborough sort of fits and starts. I mean, Gil, I know that you went to Foxborough. I don't know if you have any key takeaways from that, but they did a fair amount of re rehab of the building as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Foxborough is a good example to look at because it's close, and you can go down and see it. <clears throat> and um, what they did <clears throat> is there, there's several sections to it, but large buildings like the ones at the Bedfield State Hospital uh, they renovated and their original idea by the developer was to sell them as condominiums and their timing was bad because they hit right at the slump of the condo market. So they ended up um, as leases, rentals. Now, and we had a picture in the slide presentation of what it looks like and it really is very attractive if you look at the buildings. They're kind of like you would imagine if, um, if we restore the buildings and put them into condos or apartments. And I met with the, um, the developers of it, and I also met with the managers, people that are running it. And it's uh, fully occupied, fully, you know, 97% uh, occupation. There's <coughs> other sections of it. So those are like the restored buildings like we would see up at our hospital. There's other sections which are um, single family townhouses, and that's sort of adjacent to it. They're new buildings. Uh, also extremely successful, and the developer was very profitable, so it's been a good a good deal for him. And there's um, a recreation complex. Uh, uh, there's a baseball field, soccer fields. So that's another part of it. So in some ways, it's 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 a good a good example of what can be done. Now the problem was, I would say, on the downside, is that um, they uh, sold it originally to one major developer. Um, and uh, that developer went bankrupt. And uh, not because of the hospital, but because of the business environment at that time. Um, but as a result of that, um, other parts of it became successful. And I would say now, if you go down and look at it, it's a, um, it's a good example. Um, we have a copy of their zoning plan, it's in their master plan. So I think that is a, a good example. The other one that I think is very good is uh, is Northampton uh, near Amherst. And that's another one that's kind of analogous to, to what, what we're doing. We actually had um, Mass uh, Housing, the person that's actually managing that, meet, meet with the committee. And we went out there, I think we had at least two trips where we did tours and met with people and so on. And I think we have a picture of that in the presentation too. And I think that's another good example because it's um, mixed use, mixed development, um, they didn't restore many buildings. They kept, uh, they tore down a lot. As Steve said, they had this huge Kirkbride building, 500,000 square feet plus, you know, almost as big as our whole thing. Um, and they tried and tried and tried to figure out how they could uh, restore that building and put it into alternative uses. They had multiple studies done, and people loved the building, had a lot of uh, emotional, historical <coughs> attachment to that area and they couldn't figure out a way of doing it. <laughs> so they ended up demolishing the building and then um, put in this more mixed-use, mixed-development area. And there's, uh, interestingly, quite a bit of commercial and light industrial that's um, up there. So um, that's why I think in our plan we're encouraged, you know, by having a reasonable percentage of commercial and light industrial um, activity up there. But that's another good example. Northampton, I would say, and uh, Foxborough are, are, are good examples that we can learn from. Thank you. Gilly, you've had a one sentence summary, though, of your takeaways. It had something to do about flexibility. What was your a lesson learned from your visits? Does anybody remember what that was? It was that was Foxborough. They said, be, be very firm in your objectives, <coughs> yeah. but be flexible in the details. Because the developers will have more insight on construction and market forces 
And if they have a better way of achieving your objectives, that's going to be better for them, that's going to be better for you. So that was his takeaway from us. Is that mm-hmm. we, got, we had to be flexible because of circumstances, but we never wavered on what we were trying to do there from an objective standpoint. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Question? Uh, two, actually. Uh, first question is, uh, partly for Pat, partly for the uh, full team, is that uh, you did a Monte Carlo analysis initially from both the town <coughs> viewpoint and from the uh, developer viewpoint. Town viewpoint certainly looks solid, but that was conditioned upon the success of the developer viewpoint in which there was roughly a 50-50 probability of success, which certainly seemed to this member of the Warren Committee somewhat low. Has there been any further work, Pat, and I know you're considering doing that, on that Monte Carlo? Do you have any sense of what's happening from a developer viewpoint on that? Uh, so I'll just give this caveat. As I mentioned, I've started in on it. Um, don't fully trust that it's dialed in, but the indica- early indicators are that it looks better for the town than the last time around. Um, better for the town or the developer? Town. For the town. The town, yeah with a relatively tight distribution of outcomes, they all end up in the, the positive. Uh, with the developer, it's um, shifted to the positive for the center point by um, a few million, but there's still a very large swing, you know, like 40 million of the negative, 40 million of the positive, uh, which, you know, gets to, you um, you know, engagement with developers, right? So if we sat here, first off, if you have a swing of 40 million positive and 40 million negative, it says you don't really fully understand the, you know, the likely <laughs> outcomes, and that makes sense because none Thank of us are developers, right? So we could, this is, uh, you know, a question we had before us, we could try to a priori pick a project with our current modeling that we are certain would look uh, attractive to a developer, but given that big swing in outcome, we would run a relatively high risk of finding out at the end of the day that we have less a fair amount of money on the table in terms of probably a high, higher unit count than perhaps we, you know, we wanted or what have you. So I, I mean, it's not exactly answering your question, Jack, but you know, so there's two ways to do it. You can try to a priori define a project that's going to be uh, a high probability of success for a developer. Or you can go out with an RFP and see how developers respond, and you'll have better information um, as a result of, of taking that step. And I, you know, I would say that would probably be our most practical uh, way of dealing with that, you know, the uncertainty that we see in the, the model thus far. You are okay. great at setting a segue for the second question, uh, Pat. <laughs> okay. Joanna Hilbert has educated us all on the value of developer input. And I'll let her add whatever she'd uh, be pleased to. But in your next steps toward the end, you did not mention the thought of further developer input. And it would seem to me that there's been a lot of interest expressed in that, whether via RFP or RFI, some mechanism of doing just exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. Because unless this becomes attractive to developers, it will not be built, or it will not be built in the form that we wish to have it uh, built. And therefore, the key is not what the town gets today. The key is what the developers are going to build. And uh, I would just ask that in the next steps, that really be strongly considered as an input. Mm -hmm. Joanna, would you like to add something? No, I think you stated it. I I think that maybe just to and I, I, I may be asking the obvious or stating the obvious here, but just to clarify, the so the town is looking positive, developers are looking maybe 50-50, but the town is only positive if the developer is positive, right? Yeah. So, I, I mean, it, w- I guess a developer is probably not going to build it unless it's going to be positive for them, but mm-hmm. if there was a scenario mm-hmm. where a developer did build it and then it turned out not to be positive for them, that ends up probably not being positive for the town as well. So not to get too geeky on you, but the okay. covariance <laughs> and the outcome for the town and that for the developer 
is not that strong. You know, once a property of a certain value is in place, and you know, we can pretty much predict what the tax revenues are going to look like from that. We can make a decent guess at what you know how many school kids are going to be there. So that's why it's a, a narrower distribution. There's less uncertainty. But the development costs themselves are approaching for the for the hospital are approaching uh, you know 300 million. And if you you know if you get a you know, five or ten percent swing in the costs to the developer, they see a lot more very, you know, that's the one of the key drivers in the variability of the developer outcome, you know, the way we're modeling it. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Pat, one last point uh, on that. You have something I think going for you in the model, okay? Which is the model was based previously on earlier tax rates for this town. <laughs> looking at what transpired. <laughs> 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 opportunity. <laughs> I admire your ability to see a silver lining. <laughs> the money spent. Getting <laughs> <laughs> um, back to the internet examples that you know we saw and how other people did it. Um, again, the the big. Um, Thing, thing that chokes a lot of people is the upfront inf infrastructure costs is our uh, challenge. Here, here. And um, did we observe in any of the other examples <coughs> that these other communities had to swallow these huge upfront infrastructure costs in order to uh, make the project forward the way we're <coughs> essentially looking at it now? Well, and the models are dramatically different. In, in Northampton, Mass Development really acted as the mass developer and, and incur a lot of expenses, but we're not best developed, so I think we're going to propose to build that one. Um, but that is a different model where they really incur a lot of infrastructure expenses on their own, as opposed to someplace like Danvers, where I think the, the solution was, uh, I alluded to the fact that you can to either put in money or increase the density, and, and based on looking at the, that Danvers project, they, they took the latter approach, it's, it's got a lot more units than, um, than we would uh, propose. So that is another approach that sweetens the pot for the developers. So, um, in fact, that's, I mean, that is probably one of the key challenges in this. So, um, you know, you could throw a lot more units up there and make more confidence. So, that is, that's, that's possible. Does Northampton have a commercial and industrial tax base? And there's a few colleges in the area. Um, we know Danvers does. We know Foxborough does. So. Right. I, I don't know that. Northampton has always had a, a as the county seat of Hampshire County, it's always had a strong um, industrial and commercial tax base. It is the home of Smith College, but it is the commercial center of Hampshire County. And it also has an industrial area on King Street um, that goes north of downtown. And Colomagrin Col Col is the company that out uh, outgrew the area on King Street in order to stay in Northampton, they moved to Northampton State Hospital. And Northampton State Hospital also got significant um, financial resources from earmarks in the state budget. Before we move on, I just want to make sure we get the answer to Martha's question, because I thought that was a really good question. And so are we unique in that because of the way that our hospital is located and because of the way the utilities were pulled out, et cetera, that we have these really high infrastructure costs? Or do pretty much all of these hospitals have to face with the same kinds of degree of, of infrastructure well, costs? You know, the old adage in real estate, location, 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 you know, it's all pretty specific. I mean, we have, the site is, it's big, it's on Hospital Road, which isn't the site of the most robust infrastructure existing at this point. Um, the, for instance, Westboro actually was this sales partnership model that he can pioneered. It was Westboro and Menfield that happened at the same time. But the Westboro's property was only nine. So I mean, a completely different infrastructure story there. Um, and they ended up, they, they bought it and wanted to do a lot of sports fields there. So they kept a bunch of sports fields that happened when they sold the chunk for a bunch of dollars. 700 yeah. units. 700 units. Yeah. Yeah. 55 and older units. Yeah. 
it's pretty hard to, yeah. But this could be sort of a unique nut that we have. Our, our infrastructure might be more of a stumbling block with this project than, than some of the other ones. Would that be safe to say? No, but I'm just talking about where we are. Medfield has our own infrastructure. Yeah, we're going 128 and on the other road, but it's like right near major highways. No train stations, no highways, no lines, no lines. I'm thinking more of like water, sewer, electrical, that kind of stuff. The basics. Thank you. The answer is yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Pete. Questions for you. Uh, I, I'm still curious. I wasn't sure that you guys answered the uh, Jack's question about further outreach to developers. Um, I've been curious about so, it. it would be we would benefit from that type of input. Uh, it's only from, with, with three different things, and, and, and one would be something informal. I think we've been advised of the risk of doing that at this juncture. We, we did it early on, but it was at a point where we didn't have a kind of very concrete plan. We were looking for a lot of input, and so there was no real concern that we were potentially interfering with the bidding process by giving somebody an inside track. As you get to this point in the process, I, 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 we've been advised it's harder to do that because you actually have more concrete, um, more concrete planning, you're more likely to be running a disposition process, so you may then be you know, fouling that up by talking to a committee that about it. Mm -hmm. Other people talk about doing an RFI, and I think the committee discussed that, and by and large feel like the RFI may just be time consuming and not yield a lot of useful information because if it's not a real disposition, people would put in a limited amount of, of time and energy into a response because it's really just going to be giving you free information as they suggested. So, I mean, it's possible to do, but it seemed like it was going to take time and maybe not be the most useful um, step. The last being a, a real formal RFP, but of course the RFP requires a lot of work and a lot of preparation and thought. But, I think if that's past it, that's when the rubber hits the road, when the developer is really going to put their number on the table and say, we can do it for X, but we can't do it at all, and I'm going to bid, or we would do it if we could do 400 units rather than 300 units. So, um, so our, our feeling is that going to the RFP model is probably the best approach to really get the feedback. And the clients so the developers are willing to bid on it, and, and if, if what the constraints are that they put it in their bid. So, you can do the other two to try and get some some informal feedback, but it's, it's pretty tough. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I think somebody's going to make that decision on what the next step is, but we feel like we weren't really in a position to go that next step at this point. Okay, if, I, if I could just chime in for a minute. Uh, I would agree with what Steve's saying. If, if you were actually going to take an individual developer and basically work something up based on that entity's input to the exclusion of others, uh, and then basically you no longer have a level playing field when you put it up. Uh, on the other hand, I think there is the ability to uh, informally meet with a variety of developers and get input as to what the market interest is from the developer's perspective. Uh, problem with the RFP, and, and I've been there on smaller projects in Franklin repeatedly, is you lose a lot of time, and if you're off the mark, you don't get any responses, it's just lost time, you've got to go back to the drawing board. So you, you really need to have a sense of what the market is before you put something out on the street. Here, here. Marcus Franklin used RFIs at all? We've used our five, we've also met informally with uh, various developers. We had, there, there are certain commercial developers that have worked in the Franklin area, because Franklin has had more of an industrialized base than we do over here. So there's some that we know. So we have received input from them, and <coughs> even to the point of uh, one round of uh, RFPs where developers said, I'm not interested in bidding on this, but if this doesn't come to fruition and you want to put out another RFP that contains these components, yeah, I, I would be prepared to respond. Um, and that was a project that's now under construction uh, right off of Pond Street at 495 of the old type of sewer beds, which originally was a proposed to town wanted to see it done as largely non-residential, if not mixed use. But unfortunately, uh, a lot of the residents here are very vocal about 
not wanting to see it develop in a way that was going to increase traffic. So ultimately, it can turn into a, essentially over 55 projects, over 90, 90 to 100 units, I think, it's under construction now. So it sounds like perhaps a second round table is a possibility that what happened to I mean, one of the things that I've decided about my career as an attorney is that one of my most valuable assets to my clients is my gut reaction to situations from having learned certain things over decades of doing it. And so I, I'm, I, would, I guess I could be curious to get that sort of gut reaction from developers. I don't know whether the RFI is a way to do that or, or how you do that. Um, well, I had another question, which was in terms of, uh, I've always been a great believer in what John Locke said about when people uh, work on things, they acquire an ownership of it. So clearly you guys are the owners of the hospital at this point. Um, yes. <laughs> so I, I my question for that is, is uh, uh, are you folks at all interested in carrying the process forward at this point? There's, there seems to be sort of a, a, a demarcation happening. I mean, money's running out, and, uh, um, and there's been talk about a, a different committee to do with the uh, uh, that development aspect, and that maybe this isn't the committee for development. But, is, I guess there, is there some interest amongst you folks in, in continuing on with the project? We haven't ever discussed it, but I'll ask you. Just from a personal standpoint, I think our knowledge is pretty amazing at this point. Yeah. Um, so I would like to see, at the very least, our committee work with the implementation committee, not press, um, but at least be able to pass along what we want. Um, it's not, obviously not every you know, kind of detail is in the plan, so um, I think that would be very helpful for the next group. So that's one of you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I have no plans on staying on this committee forever, but uh, yeah, no, I think there needs to be an implementation committee, because I, I think, you know, that, that some of the questions that are being asked may be answered by the next bill. Yeah, I agree with that. that um, the, the amount of time and effort that's gone into this, the amount of research that we've done, and the amount of contacts that we've developed for it, that if you just dismiss this committee and start a new committee, you're going to lose maybe not all of that, but much of that knowledge. And I think from the point of view of the town, to be efficient, what you want to do is take advantage of all the stuff that we've learned and apply that to the, you know, to the, ne to the next phase. So I think at a minimum you want to have a con some continuation of it. Certainly I think you want to have it. If the next steps are things like finalizing the plan and then moving up to a, a, a vote, a town meeting in the fall, you have to have the, um, the background, the knowledge, and the skills of how to actually put that together. And I think one of the things that the, um, that the committee has formed, it's formed a number of very effective subcommittees that have put a lot of the stuff together, a financial subcommittee. We've had a catalyst committee, as you know, that's been very effective. We have a communication committee that's been incredibly good. So a lot of the stuff that you see, the public sees, is coming out of these committees. And I think if, um, one way or another, you need, you need that, particularly if you're going to get up to the point of making a, a public vote on this, which I think is the, is the, is the next thing to do. Well, the education still to be done, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. also. Is there another to say something? No, I was, I was just going to say, uh, I think Gil said it pretty well, but I think that, um, well, first of all, I, I think that a vote is in order that the town people, the townspeople deserve to be able to vote for this plan. Um, they have certainly participated in it, and I think that this committee is the best committee to explain the plan as it is. Um, you know, going forward, I definitely think a, a, you know, implementation committee is necessary. But I think in terms of explaining the plan, this is the committee to do it. And that the townspeople have a right to hear this plan and to say yay or nay, because we have had huge public participation. 
So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's Steele, well, I have a question though, and what that means, because to the point that was made over here, that what you've learned is to be clear on your objectives, but flexible on your details. When if we were to take the plan to the town, and they say yay or nay, what is it they're saying yay or nay about? Is it the objectives or is it the details? See, it's the zoning. Oh, if, okay. if that's, if that's clearly, what that, I thought you were talking about zoning, clearly. I, mean, that, I thought you were talking about yeah. the plan, and I was trying to understand exactly what's the question. Oh, I, okay. I would chime in on that one and say it's definitely <coughs> the objectives. You know, there are many workable plans, just to continue with the universe of possible combinations of things we can do up there. There are many possible good plans. This is a particular insta instantiation that would hopefully make it you know, concrete in people's minds, but it can change. It can, just, it can serve as a you know, guidepost or a benchmark against which we measure you know, other things that come in, other proposals from developers or other ideas that people have. And I think it can only be seen that way. So the gap that I would see in trying to do that mm -hmm. is the gap of having the public actually understand the monetary trade-offs. When they make that decision, the objective just by itself in a vacuum, they'll really want dog walking paths or something, and yet that doesn't really help us figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. How would you go about bringing that financial side in so when people say what they want, they actually know what the implications from a financial standpoint are going to be? Yeah. Well, I, I guess this would get, uh, I'll answer it partially in response to the previous question as to what you see yourself doing forward. So I think that we can lay out the trade-offs. There's many uh, you know, different uh, you know, financing options to be um, uh, evaluated. Um, there are also trade-offs in terms of you know, density versus you know, covering infrastructure, stuff like that, uh, that can be laid out. And speaking for myself going forward, I think that when it comes to implementation, I have every confidence you can find somebody more qualified to do that than myself, but I'd like to be uh, pleased to, <laughs> please to you know, participate in the, the transition and you know, maybe do something like that to uh, you know, lay out that financial analysis. Okay. 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 No, I, I know. I just, I just <laughs> jumped in on the question. Yeah, but when you heal the cows in your time, it's just a I have a long list of questions, but I guess it's not me off when I run out of that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, quick question for you. If we had to become more mercenary about one piece of property on this, in other words, go about trying to take, this is pristine property on the Charles River, in a wonderful place with views in 360 degrees, however you turn. If for the financial side of this, we needed to basically exploit something with a going, I'll tell you what's driving my question is, I heard that the Larkins have sold the unit for a million fifty thousand dollars. So suddenly, we're next to property that sells units for a million fifty thousand dollars. Now all of a sudden, my head starts. Some of these financial problems maybe aren't the things we think. If we're if we're talking about it, but if we were going to do that on this property, where would you look first? Well, I think that the spirit of the plan is has been to try to concentrate the development in the existing areas of the development, but. We had in buildings 10A and 10B, which overlook the river, and those have always struck us as being particularly, those are not existing, those would be new construction, and this would be potential for a high end of some kind. And, and the other, the Arboretum, although we, we were trying to be respectful of uh, the specs of the Arboretum and not, not make it too dense. But the other possibilities are you know, some small infill, I guess, if you would, on the west slope. We tried to keep the north. Um, Field free and keep the front of the property free as being you know, really attractive features that, that enhance it. But the other possibility that we put around is finding, um, we, as we 
as, as I said before, these buildings could all be torn down and turned into high-end condos if that's the, if that's the thing that comes back that's most attractive. Another alternative that we look at is building additions on these. So you can rehab them, but then build several high-end condos off the back of some of these. So there are different ways you could approach that if you wanted to move something over here and the possibility of new construction as well. So it's, it's in the plan, and the plan is flexible enough to allow that. It's just a question of whether that's who you want to go or not. And, and that may drive you to thinking that, that new construction is going to be much more lucrative because you can get million plus condos, and that's certainly possible. Um. I think it's important to point out that there's been a series of consultants, and we were only here for the last year. VHB, who does a lot of work for the de um, development community, really did, took a new construction perspective. They did three different scenarios that were rejected by the committee and members of Medfield. And all three of those were a deficit, all new construction for the most part except for maybe saving Lee Chapel. All those were in the tank negative on infrastructure. The cost did not cover the cost of infrastructure. So it's not an issue of historic preservation. It's an issue of the cost of infrastructure. I, I wasn't implying a whole brand new plan. I was saying if you needed to raise the octane on some part of this project, where would you look? I just, I, I just, okay. so yeah, the question. solution is not okay. just new, you know, because the $30 million plus tax credit cash flow from historic preservation is significant to the, to the overall um, financials from the private side. Yeah, although, Steve, your answers actually seem to leave the historic buildings more or less alone. So I'm just looking for, given it feels a little tentative on uh, everybody being happy financially, I'm sitting there saying, if you had to goose this a little bit from a financial standpoint, where are the opportunities? The, 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 the highest leverage is like replicating building 10B a few times is their fastest path to uh, closing a gap. There were also some um, accommodations made for potential extensions of the buildings on the north side yeah, of North yeah. Street. Yeah. So that's one place to actually put that to. Yeah. Uh, and my next question probably ties back into Jen. And it was a meeting probably six or eight months ago. Uh, in your slides, you talked about master developer or non-master developer. But there was a meeting, I think it was six or eight months ago, that the idea of a private par public-private partnership was the issue it intuitively makes sense to me that that would be the case because if we're not looking for the highest economic value and we have a set of non-economic objectives and we want to retain some degree of influence and control that points me in the direction of a public-private partnership except i don't know how you build them for something like this in in you don't have to answer it but is that something you'll address in the master plan in a way that we'd actually not forget that idea and be able to look at it I don't, it, you know, as I hear a lot of people talk about public-private partnerships, and, and, and what I look at is usually, um, well, I mean, it takes some different forms, but they're usually not really a partnership. And, and so, I, you know, having ground leases is sort of a partnership. I mean, we own the land, and we have long-term control that the developer is implementing it. So, not, it is what you mean by public-private partnership. The other, you know, people, the public sector provides money, and the private sector does the development. So the, there's so many different meanings of that, that yes, we built in some of those concepts in the plan, but we don't have a section that says here's the public private partnership and how it works. So I guess I, I, I think you know more what you have in mind. But I was reacting to what you presented, which kind of said, well, you can either parcel this out by yourself, and you're kind of the, you're not the master developer, but you're the master development subdivider, yeah. or you can find a master developer and do it. So it came across to me as an either or, and where my head went was, what we really needed something in the middle. There's some of the leasing issues, again, I'm not a real estate developer, but sometimes when the town talks about wanting to lease things because they want to hang on to the control, if I put myself in a totally unqualified way in a developer's mindset with a financially marginal model, and I look at this further risk factor that the people who own this property want to retain control over it. That, to me, 
to raise the value of that property. I mean, I'm not suggesting we sell everything, but you know, here, here. getting at is if you are trying to lease more than it makes sense to lease, the commercial stuff I've got, the, the private sales, it sounds like maybe no. Uh, but what I'm, where my head is at is how much of what we're trying to do to retain control are we actually paying a price for in the value of that property to the developer? I mean, I think it really depends. I do a lot of I do a lot of work with rentals, and, and, and if, if it's done appropriately, I don't think it's a big drag. I mean, if, if you want to design a rental where you're really in the developer's business and you require approval of everything, yeah, then it's a serious drag. But if you do it right, it's it's a it's a really useful mechanism to that does give you ultimate control. But as long as you exercise the control in a way that says here are my objectives, you know, that you're going to do this, and as long as you stick to that plan, you're fine, you're welcome to do your business, and you don't have to realize we're there, other than, it, you know, check in with your editors to make sure you're doing the plan. But, so plus, you can potentially deliver a financial benefit to the developer by not having put the upfront capital in there. Right. Or exactly. I mean, it, it, so, and, and just because you have a ground lease doesn't mean you have significant ground rent, it could be a dollar a year ground rent, so it's not like it has to be a drag, although it could be if, it, if it's lucrative enough, you can charge rent. Um, do you have an alternative? You mentioned the, I'm not, for everybody, I'm not advocating this alternative D, but the alternative benchmark, I think, has been take everything down, clean up the property, keep the, keep the chapel, keep the chapel, but everything else has been done. Um, and, and that not as necessarily an alternative that we want to think about doing, but as a benchmark on the cost that the town is on the book for. Uh, it's a useful financial benchmark for me because it's like, well, if we knew I put money into it, this is what we could do. We could take it all down at this cost, we could sell it back off at this cost, and we wind up with a net. And that, that for me is meaningful when we talk about town, the town making investments on in, in infrastructure or anything else. What is that alternative? And you, you know, from the Shack days, it was $12 to $15 million to do that. What's the alternative? Well, and, and that's not necessarily the only alternative. Because the other alternative could be status quo, which is you just continue to monitor the buildings, you leave them where they are, you pay them, you know, to keep them reasonably secure and you know their assets and whatever that's costing the town. Now you just decide you're going to keep them that every three years or five years if the building looks like it's going to fall down, we then incur the cost of the town. So, I mean, the, the difficulty in developing that alternative scenario like that is, is it depends on a lot of different factors which are hard to know in advance. But if you really want to look at, well, we just want to demo them all, what's the cost of that? We did have some numbers, but Kathy, I don't know what the last the order of 25 million. million. Yeah, that's the prevailing way. Yeah, but you also have the challenge of needing to do fill. You have to do hazardous material remediation before demolition. Because it's okay, not that, that it's that a... That was all in the original estimate that we had. Uh, there was a separate estimate for hazardous material at one point in time. We also carried a number for it. We also did calculations as how much it would cost to do fill of all the basements and sub-basements and the steam tunnels, which is, if you were doing a total demolition thinking you could reuse the land, mm -hmm. you would want to do, that would be the, the range. So the answer, is there some flexibility on that? Yeah. So the answer to my question, it was a, it was a benchmark question. It wasn't, let's, let's look at this seriously. But to answer my question, it sounds like 25 million less the resale value of the land with this thing up. Yeah. And then the interesting piece of that, because I was having this conversation with Kathy, because we're trying to you know, anticipate uh, this question. And they say, okay, so what can you sell the land for? And then the answer is, well, it depends on what the use is. You know, are you going to allow a fair amount of density, or uh, is it going to be a park, or whatever? So that makes it I wasn't asking so that we know if this is 24 million and this is 23 million, let's go to 23. I was, I was trying bigger than a bread box, smaller than a bar, kind of numbers to know where we're at. Gus, I, th I think your question's an important one. Let me just say that the Financial Subcommittee initially wanted to look at four alternatives. Alternative number one was raising it, as you just discussed. Alternative number two was the preferred scenario, the one that uh, Steve has just presented. Mm -hmm. Alternative number three was a variant of the pre uh, preferred scenario in which you might raise some of the buildings in the quad increase the density, particularly in and around the quad uh, area, but keep a large share of the historical tax credits. 
And alternative number four was the one that you asked for in your objectives, which has not yet been done, which is what's the highest economic value, 450 units, 500, whatever it might be. So those four were purportedly going to be done uh, by the committee. I assume those will all be done in the final report statement. Well, I, I don't know what highest economic value means. I mean, that's the there's, there's no upper limit on that. For 100, 100 plus acres, Well, I think you guys have to make a decision on what might be both saleable to the town and the highest upper end it could be. I don't know that it's 300 units, okay? And I know that Gene has often told me that the Lee Chapel would make beautiful condominiums. know, to Gus's point, <coughs> shouldn't we know, is that a $10 million of jump in revenues? Is it a $20 million jump in revenues? What is it? Okay. clarification in the scenario you just described where all the buildings fall in on themselves it's not 25 million yeah. it's probably 50 or 75 million because it's got to go to a license by definition that's all hazardous waste it has to go to a hazardous waste landfill and I know you mentioned there's one in Ohio I heard there's one in Maine when I was working at the Dow Chemical Company we had the only licensed hazardous waste landfill in the state of Michigan and by law, we could put nothing in it but ash out of our power plant. So, I mean, these things are very rare. And we don't know what that number is, but it's, it's at least two to three times higher. So you don't really want to have, you don't want to take the risk of having any of those buildings fall in on themselves. Just no, I, I'm just okay. saying, from the standpoint of view, I don't It doesn't change your thought experiment, but, but the risk profile is high. So, by doing this, we're preferring it's a very so high risk. You have to evaluate what the existing risk is of those buildings, the likelihood that they will fall down. I think it's 
Register of Historic Places. And you have a $34 million cash flow with federal historic tax credits on developing, all, you know, redeveloping the, um, the buildings on the campus. The open space as part of the campus is part of the National Register nomination and was specifically identified in the National Register de listing decision as important to the overall contribution and sense of place and the historic fabric. So, so major alterations of the green or the quadrangle and will could jeopardize that $34 million cash stream. So that, I would expect that would be something the developer would recognize and take into account. It depends upon what kind of developer you talk to. It, as someone who does subdivision development is not going to be thinking about preservation and the restrictions. So p part of the work that this committee is focused on is there's a lot of restrictions on this land that the Board if of Selectmen signed tax, off on. Mm -hmm. I think, but in addition to the tax credits, though, I think what Kathy just said is the type of developer you talk to. 
Because if you look at the, the size of developer that might be a master developer on this site, they're going to look at this as a gorgeous piece of property on the Charles. And they're going to look at it from an imageability standpoint. And what's going to be just as important to them as the up, buildings up on the hill is the approach to those buildings, right? And how it feels to drive up to it. So one developer might say, yeah, I'll put some more houses there. Another developer of a different scale might say, this is a beautiful front yard for what is going to be a really great development of, of a certain ilk right on the top of that campus. And so I think I think the perception is is going to be different on who you talk to. Well, I think I take away from that we don't want to just hire some subdivision developer. <laughs> right, but, developer and I'm, yeah. I'm okay with that. <laughs> okay. Um, Can I ask a question of Martha? Are we another constraint the committee has always considered is that sort of magic number of school children? Mm -hmm. Is that still around 300 as the kind of cap we don't want to get too close to? Well, that's a number that we generated based on the capacity for the 2017-2018 year. That's a number that will change. Yes. So if if you know if we go five years from now. That number needs to be readdressed because clearly the smaller, you know, the lower grades are bigger than the higher grades in terms mm -hmm. of population. So our excess capacity will be diminishing over time. So um, that's not stagnant. I guess that's a problematic. It's 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 a constraint to consider if you were going to clear the land and build new. You may have to consider an additional school if you're bumping over significantly over 300 students. Right, and there's definitely a way to factor that cool. in. You know, that there's a step function is that, you know, you can fit more students in yeah. with our existing infrastructure, and then when you hit a certain point, it pops up, and then it's still incrementally a small amount of number. But, right. yeah, Thank you definitely need to consider that. Uh, so, Martha, are we at roughly 221 at the moment? Pardon me? Uh, the number of students? Number of students. I don't know what the current financials look like. I haven't seen the model in a long time. You mean in this plan, Jack? Is that yeah, in this yes. plan? Yeah. I mean, Martha's exactly right in what she said about the 300 cap and then uh, the some ability to move up at a higher cost. But we were below that in the model. Yeah, yeah we, had, we had a buffer before, before we would get to yeah. the 300. So it's not as though a one or two more, you know, it, you'd right. <laughs> I would say that any time you would make a significant modification, any time you make any modification, you look at what it is that developer comes in with, you have to go back and look at the town numbers again and sure. make sure they still make sense. So that's that's a Can iterative process. One, one thing, and though it does depend on where the kids come in. Right Certainly. now, the elementary schools are packed. Certainly. You've got capacity at the high school, so if you build new, we're already at capacity. They're talking about modulars for the younger grades. So yeah, I, I look I, when I looked at the capacity, I definitely looked at it on a building by building basis, and and clearly the lower grades are are tighter. But you can't. It's hard enough to predict how many yeah. new pupils per household are coming in. Never mind how many Dale yeah. Street pupils per household. You know, you've got, to, you've got to make an estimate. It's, it's an imperfect science, but it's a it's a reasonable estimate. One last question. The, one, of the, one of the things that I've always thought, one of the best that this committee has produced, and it's not gotten the visibility that I would have expected, is the catalyst list. How will, yeah, and the reason I care about it is because this is a unique piece of property, so we can have the generic discussion about housing units and what it costs and what a developer wants to do. But that discussion, it can get you to an economic answer, it doesn't get you to a unique identity and a distinctive quality to the property that suddenly puts it on the map is something that no one else can have because we have this unique configuration. We're going to be 20 minutes away from all highways, but we're right off the Charles River. We have walking trails. We have open space on all sides. We have a tradition that's tied in there. The catalyst list to me was the thing, not the developer side of this, I'm talking about the true catalyst list of the ideas for development that could go in there, it was always one of the most important things to me that you did because those things were different. How does the catalyst list fit, it, fit into the investment plan? Well, I mean, as a physical matter, we, we, I think Bill has done a, a report on it that we're attaching as an to the plan. I, mean, I think they Outgrowth of the past is we didn't have a pretty little grid like a lightning strike, but we would go meet with somebody and, and they would say, Oh, but wait, you've forgotten that we can do X there, and, um, and that sort of changes your whole view of what kind of happened there. I don't think we ever had an aha moment. It was a combination of things like agriculture, mm -hmm. culture center, and education institutions, and other things that kind of influence that thinking. 
let me just explain what we mean by a catalyst. You know, if you remember your chemistry, a catalyst is something that accelerates or that turns on. So it's not passive, it's very active. So we had a catalyst, you may have seen on the south, three or four people, very small. So what we did is we deliberately went out to different kinds of groups or people. A lot of it was, you know, any personal contacts or people that came to us. And I would say, I, and I agree, I think it was it was creative and imaginative because it, it wasn't following the developer trend or anything like that. So some of the ideas that came out were, I thought, very helpful. <clears throat> One was um, in terms of assisted living, retirement, that spectrum of, of, uh, um, of needs in the town. We got, you know, I would say very positive feedback that something like that is is viable in this community, is, is needed in this community. And some of the buildings may be particularly useful for that. Now, one of the things that we found is that the, the buildings as they were designed back in the late 1800s are very small, they're very chopped up. And if you want to have a viable CCRC, continuing care retirement community, you need a, a larger footprint, you need a larger structure. So one of the innovative ideas on the east side of the campus in the dark uh, orange color is to actually tie the buildings together, to, to link the buildings together so you get a larger, you know, larger um, footprint. So that was one idea that is built in here. <clears throat> Another idea I think that, that came out of the catalyst meetings is we met with a number of developers that specialized in restoration of old buildings. You know, like mills. You know, Lowell is an example of that. But there's a lot of other old um, schools, for example, or factories, buildings like that. And one of the things that, that, they, they, that they told us was that it's quite feasible to take an old building, even if it's in pretty bad shape, and restore it and bring it up to a, a, a level that meets uh, building codes, meets the needs for the 21st century, even though these are old buildings. So that one of the things I think that, that is embedded in this is that idea of taking the, uh, the old buildings and, and modernizing them and bringing them into um, current, you know, current uses. Another thing that I think, and I felt this is extremely important, is that this, the hospital in many ways was an agricultural, the farming and agricultural aspect of it was one of the key things that made this, that was the function of the hospital. And so we talked to um, different kinds of organizations. Um, we talked to um, Volante, you know, we talked to local farms, we talked to Candorini Farm, we talked to probably half a dozen, you know, organizations like that. And they said, you know, don't lose that element to it. Don't lose that dimension to it. And a developer might say that's nonsense. Right? But for us, because it makes very much the unique property of that hospital site, you know, we have like the idea of uh, cafes, of uh, farm to table restaurants, we have the idea of community gardens that are built into it. And we've always been open to the idea of working with the state on the properties that are adjacent to it, right? I mean, that, we didn't buy it, but the, the people I've talked to have always been very nimble to that, right? What do we do with A1 and A2? And why is that, you know, that part of it? So the agricultural flavor to it makes a very important part of this. And in the catalyst meetings that we had, kick that came out. Uh, another one is um, on sports and recreation. We met with, I don't know, maybe four or five different groups like that. And they said, take advantage of the of the location, not just the sliding hill, you know, repainting it, but also the access, like you pointed out, to the Charles River, you know? I mean, again, it's not great, you know, it's sort of down the path that they have a new site. But you could do a lot of sports and recreation, taking advantage of the proximity to the Charles River. In other words, taking features of the natural environment, agriculture, again, landscape, river, and incorporating that into the design. And we tried to do that. You know, we tried to do that. My, you're making my point, and that was my question was, is that stuff going to show up with us? So 
And, and, and I would say, too, that, that that's something that should be continued. You know, I mean, it's not, I mean, we've done 30, maybe, 30 plus meetings like that. Which we've, um, we've, we've documented all of them, so we have the notes and, you know, we have the information from that. But that idea, I think, is, um, is good because it brings you out of the, you know, kind of the box. It gets you thinking out of the, you know, housing, housing, housing doll. It is, and uh, some of those things may be the evolve as we build the core of housing there, because in some cases they are dependent on our restaurant, on having a people at the site or visiting the site that to enable us. So we have a the cultural center activating the site, the, the housing will activate in some respect too, but getting people up there and getting the site inertia going may help leverage some of the other paddles that are a little harder to do in which the site is already. Well, I just didn't want to lose that yeah. creative. And, and, and Gus, one other idea that we have in the plan is an inn. An inn, right? Like a boutique inn, right? And the uh, West Hall, which is on the lower left corner, that orange road, we thought might be a very feasible, you know, small inn, wine inn. Well, there's very little housing around here. If you have relatives in or friends, or if you have cultural activity up here, you need a place for people to stay. So for myself, with some of those other capitalist opportunities you actually talked to somebody that wanted to do it, that will be a far more compelling argument for me if you actually have someone, uh, not the actors, you've got, you got a few more weeks for the end of the month, but if we had someone who had the concept that said, oh, I know exactly how to do this, that would be a one way about it. In the absence of that, and recognizing, I think, Kathy, you put that to the very last phase, and it didn't have very attractive numbers, I would be very cautious not to want, not to, want to have that be a town idea that is looking for somebody to do it, but there's no, <coughs> you know, there's no market for that. So I'm not fighting it. Uh, I, I do sometimes have a hard time saying, I wonder who is a mental state hospital hotel Tourism, you know, what, what that market segment looks like here in the North season. Yeah, maybe we'll tie it into my path. <laughs> yeah, one of the things, Gus, on the timing, this is an important one, and, and that's why, again, on the flexibility, we don't like to own that for our kids. It has to be recognizing that it is across a long shot, but it will likely be a late phase um, addition. When it, if, if the cultural center is there and there's other stuff happening, then that's going to be a good idea. The CCRC actually. Source for that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, sort of a follow up on my, my uh, wanting to get back reactions from real estate professionals about it. When I got the materials yesterday and went through them, and I saw that the, the CCRC was 79 units. For me, that resonated because I was involved with the cell village, which we originally built as something like 150 or 160 units. And we decided. That our experience was that the administrative cost of running it made it problematic at that size. So we, we immediately built our buildings whenever we could and got it up to over 200. Uh, so I, I just think that the number 79 or whatever it was might be a problem. I, I think that is definitely a concern. I mean, I, I put on that slide TCFC or independent living. I think it may work easier at independent living because I think you're exactly right that the CCRC had a kind of funneling concept and you need enough of a the population and the independent units to support the more intensive uh, uh, buildings. But, but you know, we, we kept it in because it, we, you know, we have flexibility. It could be either of those or it could be something totally different. Um, North Hill, which is one of the houses we went to, um, we were really excited about at one point, whether they are anywhere, I don't know, but they, they were looking for places to build more independent buildings. And so they were going to key off their um, skilled nursing and assisted living and even. They were, they were interested in something of 50 to 80 units would be fine with them because it's a bit of a satellite for them. But you know, that may be a one shot thing. There may not be other, other uh, facilities like that that are interested in the same model, but at least we were open to that as another possible approach. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have more questions? No, I like your questions. 
And in order to have that discussion, I think we need to have that committee, the development committee, the implementation committee, the following committee that actually picks the ball and runs with it. So start back playing from a fall special town meeting and start putting those things into play. Uh, you know, the first move is probably the three of us figuring out how to get that committee set up. But in the absence of any funding at all, we can set that committee up and that committee can have nice conversations with itself. And Sarah will be able to use 50,000 of that to go pursue the state grant that would allow us to develop the plans for the infrastructure, which might have led to the MassWorks grant that would have gotten us several million dollars to fund the infrastructure. And this is a broad comment about why it matters for people coming to town meeting to really make the effort to understand the articles. Because if you step back and realize that in FY19, with some potential, with the possibility for some potential funding that might come out of, like the Affordable Housing Trust, to deal with some of these issues, basically the town voted not to put any money into this development, and that undoubtedly stretched the development time out by a year, and it cost us $150,000 to maintain, just maintain, cut the grass and keep security. So that the economic <coughs> decision that the town people made at the town meeting because the then was about seventy-five thousand dollars was to commit the town to an extra hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars and put us in neutral. Probably we may still be rolling in neutral, but we're we're in neutral unless we come up with something creative. And all of that, by way of saying, I'm a little worried that we won't actually have the ability to do all the things we actually probably should do to make sure our, we have our act together prior to going to that special town meeting. I, I share the fear. I think we should be looking for whatever committee is going to implement this because there's a lot of decisions that need to be made in deciding how to approach that, which are easily made just by like, you know, a group of sitting on the table for a few days. So that can be a serious challenge. Right. But I think the, the reality of that, though, is that no implementation is actually going to happen before the fall comes out. And so you know, if, if whatever is put on the warrant for the fall comes if the direction from the special town meeting is towards some sort of goal, whatever that is, whether it's this uh, proposal or something else, um, I would hope that the committee that voted for a development project at the state hospital would also vote for appropriation to pay for the work associated with the implementation. It would involve the source of funds. What did they say? I mean, again. So man, we may not want to do that. We may be doing that. But all I'm saying is, you know, if people vote for a dollar, whatever that is, I would hope they would also vote for actually being able to take them If they don't, then I think you're right. That we're going to be a neutral, but we'll have a person of adult with no real ability, other than asking Sarah to work, you know, 15, 18 hours a day. Um, <laughs> and then the only argument I make is that when we do go to special town meeting and we ask the voters to approve something, we actually are locked out and we know it's the smart thing that we really want to do as opposed to, oh, we didn't have anybody around to really talk about it, so let's just try to ramp up and approve. And that's going to be a big start for us on the other thing I think Mike alluded to is the question whether you push for any kind of disposition because the zoning itself is. Side of buildings, flexibility, and development, and then you've got to answer that texture. So, you're supposed to be a way to build there. And that probably ties into the decision about when you go to National Golfer. I can figure out a way to get some practical disposition done in the fall if we're doing it piecewise at meal. Right. Uh, but so far, all the advice I've gotten from the developers I've talked to is not to do that. So, I, I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, my, my view of it, again, just raise the question, is just to say that view of it, is that if this is the plan, or this is what the town meeting endorses, I, I don't think there's much of an implementation discussion. I just think given the complexity of the cross-building subsidization and, and all of that, I don't see any real way to do this other than the sale of the master development. And I just don't see it, and I, it, I've stated my views in the past in the our town government to do a lot of development like this, and for whether we ought to be spending our tax dollars over many, many years to hire a program manager and a law firm to, to actively manage the implementation of this, I don't think we can do it. There's no negative effects from the people who work for the town, 
it's just a comment on the size of our government and, and the size of what our government should be. And so if this is going to be the plan, given the complexity of it, and given the fact that you know, in the financial analysis, it's a close call for a developer, and so it's going to require some work. Um, I, I think the only way to implement this particular plan is with a straight sale to a master developer. So this is what the plan is, we want you to do this, and how many trucks do you be? Which seems to me you could do that at a full time meeting and add the national money at that time meeting to hire somebody to manage the RFP process to get a lot of that's not even the initial implementation. Now, I not necessarily do this, what we're going to do, but I, I think this is what the answer is. I just am looking through the complexity, just looking at it from the standpoint of the time. The, the level, the, the increased level of risk that we come from asking a government of our size, of our town, um, with however many capable volunteers you have helping them to, to implement something like this over time, I think introduces a huge new additional risk that we're going to face. And so it's straight to sale. Straight to sale. You know, we need a core ground lease and whatever. And then, to me, it's kind of the ground lease straight to sale. In other words, we are not going to be involved in picking out rocks. We're not going to be involved in where the road is going to go. We're not going to be doing anything. We're going to plan. We're going to be firm in our objectives and flexible and develop them. Like that to me is, if this is what it is, I, I just have a hard time getting the head around the idea that we're going to be, especially if the economy's going to get bad. And with any developer, you know, the force is, the plan's going to look the best when we adopt The financials will look the best when we adopt it. The force, the, the push from developers will be, you know, I hit this kind of rock, you know, what kind of rock it is. Oh, gosh, that's terrible. <laughs> You know, I need to add 20 more units to pay for this rock I hit. And then, you know, like some of the geologists are going to write, and that's what it's going to be. And then that's what it's going to be like if you're a view plan. From a developer's perspective, I'm going to start to pause and push you back to us, and we're going to be in this kind of endless back and forth, right? If you do something other than this plan, then you can also do this position. So, for that scenario, you can have to call for the developer. What would be a plan? We agree with the RFP. Well, the developer hits the rock and he's 20 more years at the process. As opposed to coming back to us and coming to negotiate on the fly, now we have to sell it. Because if we're doing the implementation, and tell me if I'm wrong, right? I just think it's going to be, we're going to be confronted with, okay, here's the next piece of it. And now suddenly the economy comes to go to us going into town, and now we're renegotiating that piece of it from what the group of plans. And the plan is not going to get more favorable to town with each renegotiation. <coughs> now, again, we've had the same problem with people have to go to develop with a banker to come back to us. Um, I mean, I, I've seen a for developers that we're going to do all of this as rental and then come back to the rental market collapses, but how much should this drama and say that we want to amend our plan and do a commercial set of rental and vice versa and the time to decide, yeah, we're going to do that or not, and it's tough to say no because if they're done, they fail. So, there is that possibility for giving take even the match development. It's kind of inherent in the business. Other questions? I mean, from your perspective, let's say town meeting versus this plan. Do you think there's any reason we couldn't authorize that this to be shot over the property or town meeting? No, I don't think so. I think the, the, the issues I do, think do come up with is a degree of flexibility. And if you're going to do a disposition, what are you going to ask them to dispose of? Are you going to put it out for an RFP with some limitations? <coughs> you know, and what, what type of mode are you going to ask for to dispose of it? And, and that's a difficult thing because then you tell us, you telegraph to the developers how so much flexibility you have. So that, that's a tough one. Um, but, but yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't say we're ready to prepare to go out for a master developer. There's another risk we face is if we come to a lot of it to the implementation phase, and we're just going out of time at the meeting, I think we will lapse into a second round of master planning through the implementation phase. We'll have your flexible zoning, and then we'll spend another implementation committee to spend another 18 months or two years deciding what our fees look like, and this, and something else. Meanwhile, you know, Gene's sitting there and raised $45 million just in the bank account. <laughs> 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 the chapel, um, you know, I think that that 
I mean, to me, you're kind of either planning or you're selling land, and you're not selling land anymore. Okay? And if you need more planning, you need more planning. But I think you know, one of the things that would inspire developers the best way to be able to come up with creative solutions here would be the best actually trying to do something here, as opposed to just sort of continuing to plan something. If I were to develop a little bit of this and look at the history of this, I would not be authorizing a great investment in planning what I would do. You're just ranging farther out the bottom line thinking that I am is probably what I say. I don't disagree, but one question I have though is if we did this, if it wasn't a developer, the land we would do it with would be the cottage arboretum core campus in West Slope or the core cottage arboretum green core campus West Slope. I'm assuming the North Field would be about it. That's a that's not you know, at all. There's a water tower, obviously, is not qualified for it. There's no reason to have the south of Hospital Road be involved in the developer. The only issue, I guess, in my mind is whether it's the four parcels, including the green, or if it's just the three that have the third. Well, I think the I would suggest you do the third. I don't think there's a same reason why you so that the green is put in that badge unless you can really do one. If we did the core campus, we'd have to redesignate it. If we, if we were moving ahead with the chapel, we would actually carve that in out of the core campus to that the other. It's the other one that we the property. Yeah, I think there are decisions to be made. I mean, you couldn't say, well, the heck with it, but I think you leave the cultural center behind and dry issues, so it's very, I think, I already thought it that you would carve out that core that you could decide whether or not you want to Restrictions exist no matter what the zoning is. So if we were to zone it as commercial, the town doesn't need any more commercial development. The developer who wanted to build something would still have to negotiate around all the various restrictions that exist. And as I understand it, and Bill, you can correct me, you go up. Either now or me, though. Not every piece of land on the green is subject to historical restriction, but not all on the Everything that you purchased, except for the water tower site, is subject to your MOU with Mass Historical. I will point out, however, that under the 440 <laughs> units that DCAM was going to build, they were going to build 17 single-family homes on the Village Green, which was, in fact, the same great lawn. They weren't you using know, all of it, but they were... their issues resolved with, with Mass Historical. You can't at that level, they would still. Have I have a letter from Mass Historic that said that they had approved it and they made some additional changes to it. And they, with, with those changes, they were going to accept it. The fact of the matter is, though, is that it, it never came to pass. The but bigger, the bigger but, point to Michael's issue is it doesn't matter about the reuse if, if, as long as you stick to the historical appearance. So you, you could very easily have non residential reuse of historical buildings depending. You'd have to deal with the existing well, historic restrictions. Right. So. Just to be clear, the Clark Building was on the green, right? The, that was it, yeah. the Clark Building lawn is the is the is the piece of land that is right now in the current uh, agreement with Mass Mass Historic. All right. That's the roadside. That is essentially the area that was in front of where the Clark Building is. So right now we're calling the Great Lawn everything. All right. Now it's the green. Yeah, rest. Just, just so you know, that's trying to like redesignate the green, but I'm sitting there looking at this irregular shape and saying, well, if it was Elms and said, gee, I can have this little ear, I would be able to do this. And I would, I, I, uh, I would also throw a couple of other things out. Uh, no, number one, you probably could swap open land somewhere else 
for some land at the front, as long as you haven't drastically changed the appearance of, of, the, of, of the property. The, the other thing is, and I, and I won't swear that this could happen, but if you think about what the requirement is in the agreement with Mass Historic for use of the buildings, you have to make a best effort to use the buildings. And if a developer comes back and says, no, I need to take this down, or I'm not going to use it, I'm going to tear it down and build up something that looks like the one that was there or whatever, I wonder if you might not be able to make the same argument for some piece of the lawn in the front, where you, you, you use the same language you would use for the buildings that say, you know, we are encouraging the use of this uh, particular area that is on the National Historic Register, uh, and a density of X houses or, you know, Y, whatever, and then the developer comes back and he says, no, to make it financially viable, I need another two acres and I need another six units or eight units or whatever. And I, I think you might have something to go forward with. I don't know if that affects how the National, uh, uh, you know, the Park Service looks upon the rest of the property or anything else, but I think you could make I, an argument. I think you're in a position of potentially jeopardizing your historic tax yeah. credits. So until you resolve your de your development issue, I would be careful about trying to change um, or sell off portions of the Great Lawn or Green um, and those other areas that have been identified as part of the historic I, landscape. I, I would suggest if, if you, you take the language that I was considering using that you would use for the buildings and you might use it for the front of the property or whatever, you wouldn't sell it off until you went back and, and made the discussions or had the discussions with either the National or the uh, Mass Historic. But if you were going to sell it, you would have to develop it at once to assume the developer, then that developer probably can preserve That's the true. credits if they want. So I mean, right. in some ways, unless you're doing it piecemeal and saying, well, we'll develop for X gets the, the green and develop for Y gets the core campus, then you set up this potential conflict where you want to adversely affect the historic credits on the other. But at the single disposition, that development community has to worry about all the issues that Bill's talking about, not us. So. And the question Pardon. to Steve or Kathy, the historic tax credits, the $34.2 million that we're using, is that the amount of historic tax credit for the developer is entitled to? As a That's of an purpose. automatic. It's on the federal historic tax credits. If you, uh, it's automatic as long as the rehab is done in accordance with National Park Service standards, Secretary of Interior standards. So there is a review process, but once you've done that, you've that review has been approved by National Park Service. You get an automatic 20% of your basis. And it's valued at 85 cents on the dollar. So it's not an auction or anything like that. It's no, you don't, don't have to auction. Yeah. And there's also state historic tax credits, but that's <coughs> not part of the 34 million. That's that, and that's an application process. Do you else have any final questions or comments? I I I do. I, I'd just like to point out that unless you're proposing very flexible zoning, that you're in somewhat of a catch-22 in my opinion. I, I think it would be a mistake to come up with, with uh, a problematic as far as the zoning unless you know what the market interest is in terms of developers and what they're prepared to do there. You can go through the exercise of rezoning the entire parcel and get no responses or no productive responses to the RFP and have to come back and do it all over again. So you need to get, in my opinion, some input from potential developers uh, and some determination of interest and then go from there to set up the zone framework.
we all need to think more about what is going to be on the agenda. That's what I mean. We have to come to our conclusions about what we are on the plan and what we want to do with it. And how we're going to set that up. That's the point. Assuming it's going to be done, we've got to focus heavily on that. Thank you. Based on the disposition of our bodies in the chat. Medfield TV Community Shows.